Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I don't know about you, but the world around us today truly feels like it's on edge. It seems at any single moment, at any single part of the day, that things could just fall apart all around us. It's kind of hard to have confidence in much of anything. We're on an entire whim, an entire industry that we may have a job in, could be turned upside down by some new technology. Or we could have our entire daily routine changed by a simple phone call from our, uh, from our work or from our neighbors. Uncertainty is something that we all live with, something that we all struggle against. And quite frankly, it's exhausting. But many of us also take this uncertainty to the next level. We take these feelings that we have about the world, the uncertainty and the confusion, and we internalize it. The shakiness we see in the world is all of a sudden evident in ourselves. We doubt our abilities. We doubt our talents. We doubt our worthiness to be in the position we're in. I've heard, it peop I've heard people refer to it as feeling like an, impo an imposter, like we shouldn't be where we are, that we got lucky somehow and don't really deserve to be where we're at. And this fills us with uncertainty. Makes us feel like we could fall apart at any moment. Makes us feel unworthy or worthless. It happens to parents as they experience the struggles of raising children. And they begin to wonder if they're truly fit to be parents. They feel as though they don't know what they're doing. That they missed a class that makes all of this make sense. And they feel like they're setting their child up for failure. They feel like an imposter trying to be a parent. It happens in the career ladder climb. As the temperature in the workplace grows and things start falling apart all around you, you can wonder if you're supposed to be here. Are my talents and abilities somehow below my station and calling? Did I just get lucky to get this job? And at any moment, I can lose it. You can feel like an imposter in your own position. It's the students I feel the worst for. Because they're wrestling with these kinds of questions, and the answers to them impact the rest of their life. Is this the right place for me? Did I pick the right school? Did I pick the right major? Can I do this for the rest of my life? Or am I just kidding myself at this point? You can feel like an imposter in your own classroom. You see, the uncertainty we have in ourselves leads us to question our position in life, our talents, our skills. Our, our own worthiness or even our ability to accomplish tasks. We can feel like an imposter in our own skin. And if you personally haven't experienced this before in any of those different areas, well, our epistle reading for today will do it for you. James speaks to us, What good is it, my brothers, if someone, does, uh, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? In his epistle, James asks the simple question, can faith, without works, save? Is our faith, as James tells us, simple knowledge? Information that we learned long ago and stuck in the back of our minds, knowledge that even the demons themselves possess, or is the faith in us one that lives, one that acts and works and bears God's good, pleasing, good fruit? or his good works, I should say. This text truly calls us to examine our own hearts. Is our faith a knowledge, or is it a life? In our text, James gives the example of showing partiality, or playing favorites, and how we might react to two different kinds of people coming into church. You can imagine a rich man walking into church, wearing a gold ring and some fine clothing, and a man wearing rather un unkempt clothes. How would we react to each? If you favor the rich man, give him the best, seat in the house, treat him with honor and dignity, while also saying to the poor man, sit at my feet, take the lowest position possible, or put him down and away. We sin when we show that partiality in welcoming one and judging and pushing away the other. See, the Christian calling is far more complex than that, though. It envelops all of our lives. It covers every relationship. It covers all of our actions, all of our thoughts, and all of our words. So we can ask the same question about everything in our life. 
Do I organize my priorities like Christ is risen? Or do I let my own wants and desires organize my life? Do I treat everyone, not just the visitor in church, with the Christian attitude I'm called to? Even those who might despise me or my Savior. Do I spend enough time in his word? Could I do more? Do I serve my neighbor with just words or do I actually truly care for them? Does my free time alone, when I'm by myself, reflect who I am in Christ? Well, the questions are truly endless we can ask ourselves. The Christian walk is not just a set of rules, but being a disciple of Jesus shapes and touch every part of our existence. It's who we are. It's a calling to realign ourselves according to his will. And as the questions pile in, as we look at what it means to be a Christian and we consider ourselves in the church, in our life of faith, this imposter syndrome can set in. Like the uncertainty of the world, we can have uncertainty within ourselves when confronted with questions like, are we truly living like a Christian? And as these questions pile up, the imposter syndrome sets in. The imposter syndrome that calls us to question our faithfulness. Am I no better than the demons who know about God? Am I a hypocrite? Am I a liar? Do I truly believe? Is my faith real? It certainly doesn't look like the lives of others. Am I saved? Is my eternity in jeopardy? These are some real questions that real people wrestle with, especially as we're shown the fullness of God's will in us. It makes this uncomfortable tension and imposter syndrome. Are we really Christians? The world and some of our fellow Christians, unfortunately, offer some advice for people feeling this way. Well, if you don't feel as though you are a Christian, just do more Christian things. Just do more. Maybe the solution for your inability to act like a true Christian is that you're not doing enough devotions. Do more of them. Maybe it's time to get serious about your faith. Maybe you should read more, follow this trend, or go to the next big seminar to catch that on-fire feeling in your soul. Maybe you should reorganize your life, shift some of the priorities around so it feels more important to you. Just do this, just do that, subscribe to this, consider that, do that. The world's advice is simply this. Work hard and do more so that imposter feeling you have goes away. Sounds like a really productive way out of the situation, does it not? Gives you concrete and real things you can do to try to claw your way out of this imposter syndrome, to get our life truly into that Christian camp so I'm no longer a hypocrite. But try as we might, no matter how long the struggle, no matter how hard we work at it, this imposter syndrome is not going to go away. As we look more and more into ourselves, truly, honestly look at who we are, and as we hold our works up for judgment, it will always be lacking. We cannot pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps, if you will. If this is the path that you're marching on, beware. It leads nowhere but despair. It leads us to despise the many hours that we spent trying to get it right. It leads us to exhaustion with no further movement and feeling better about being a true Christian. In fact, it leaves us in sadness and despair. We might delude ourselves for a while that we're feeling better or doing things that are better, but as we look at ourselves and we compare it to how we're supposed to be living in the faith, we'll always see an imposter. The dangerous truth the truth that's more difficult to face than we realize is that none of us deserve to be here. That none of us are worthy to be labeled Christians. That no amount of hard work, no amount of striving, no, about, no amount of getting it right will get us further from this hard truth. That creeping feeling you have is correct. And in humility, we hang our heads. We are the hypocrites. We are the liars. We are sinners. And our words, our desires, our deeds, all show us for who we truly are. We do not live up to that perfect image of a Christian. 
And James twists the knife a little further for us as he says, Forever keeps the whole law, but fails in just one point, has become guilty of all of it. No matter how hard we try, how hard we strive, a single point, and we're guilty of all of it. Truly, truly we are lost. Truly we do not deserve the title Christian. There's nothing inside of our hearts that merits that. But as we spoke about in our children's message today, God is a God of reversals. A God will take a weak, strong, will take a weak individual and refute the strong. Our God will be a God that dwells with sinful people instead of the people who have it all figured out. A God that takes hypocrites and liars like you and me and welcomes us to the font of grace. But his reversal goes even further. God calls us not to put our faith in the works that we do, not to trust in the try harder next time, not to trust in our ability to get it right, not to trust in the certainty of our own actions, or even trust that we might get it right in the future. But rather, God drives you and me to humility. He drives us to realize that we are truly imposters. But it's here. When we're driven to our knees, when we realize there's nothing good in us, that Jesus draws us to himself. While we cannot, while we, when we realize we cannot be who God has called us to be, when we see the futility of our actions, we lean on Jesus. Nothing inside of ourselves will do our work, our struggle, our best attempt, our try again next time. And the advice of the world falls flat. There's nothing we can do to fill the gap. We have to look outside of ourselves to something perfect, to something holy, to something beautiful we cannot find in our own selves. Namely, we turn to the cross. And Jesus, he takes off of our shoulders our imposter syndrome. He takes all of our failures, all of our shortcomings, he takes it to the cross. He takes everything that makes us hypocrites and liars and puts it to death. He then gives us his perfect righteousness, his perfection, his life that didn't need to try harder, that didn't need to do better, that didn't need to strive for perfection because it was perfect. The righteousness he gives to us is his perfection. And he rises again that we might have new life in his name, namely a new heart, a transformed life. You see, we are not imposters here in this place, but rather we are justified in Christ. It isn't dependent on who we are or where we're from, but what Christ has done for us. The finished work of our Savior is what God sees when he sees us. Yet at the same time, James's words are true. A faith without works is dead. The true humility we live in this faith is that God is a God of reversals. That he takes us as imposters, makes us brothers and sisters in Christ, and then from there, Christ our Lord grows good fruit in us. He brings forth good works, good things out of us through the transforming of our lives. He cultivates in you love for neighbor. And he sends you out into the world to actually care and support them. He cultivates in you humility, a humility that invites others to see the peace we have with God. He cultivates in you a desire for his word, a desire that leads us to where his word is preached, where it's proclaimed, and where it is written for us. He shapes and he molds you, that as you live in an uncertain world of changing times, that you might be bold in what Christ has done for you. We have true joy, the sincerest joy possible to go and bear good fruit, to do good things here in this world according to the will of God. Not because we have to or we must, but because it's who he's made you to be. It is who he is constantly shaping you into. The source of everything, the source of all of this hope and joy is Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. 
It is His perfect work in us that bears good fruit. And when we sin, and we're going to sin grievously, it calls us into that humility once again, to lean on Christ and His work for us more and more. So where do we look to grow in these things, to grow in our faithfulness? Do we follow the world and try harder? Well, no. We lean on Jesus and where Jesus promises to be. We gather around his word like we are right now. We gather around his sacrament that we'll enjoy in a few moments. We gather as his church, as we're doing here and online together. We gather around his presence where he promises to be, to have our hearts transformed and shaped, to be forgiven, to be strengthened, and to be sent out into the world to bear good fruit. Christ is the source of our belonging, and Christ is the source of our transformed life. So when we feel like imposters here at church, we don't run to our works. Rather, we run to Christ, who redeems, forgives, and shapes us until he returns. It's in Jesus' precious name that we hold and hope to. Amen.